through 27 as we reflect again upon what was said previously in the scriptures. These verses read as follows, beginning with verse 24, 24th chapter of Luke. And certain of those who were with us, uh, that's verse 24, went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. Now verse 25, then he said, Jesus said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets had spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Our theme is still the cross. The subject for this morning is the crucifixion and the resurrection. The crucifixion and the resurrection. When we considered uh, during these past weeks the cross still as the theme and, and we were thinking of the cross and associating it of course naturally with the crucifixion of Jesus himself. Many other thoughts were lifted and we were able through the word and through the messages and the direction of the Lord uh, to see other issues and other points uh, which were associated with the cross. Those were lifted and those points and thoughts were revealed. Uh, we considered each of those during uh, what was known as the Lenten season, that beginning with the uh, uh, Ash Wednesday, that it is known, and uh, going through a 40-day period up to today, uh, dealing with the cross and crucifixion. The points that we looked at, I'll just briefly touch on. Uh, the first one, uh, there were six of them, the first one had to do with suffering, suffering. We looked at what Jesus said to his disciples and to others who heard him dealing with suffering. He said, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men, all peoples unto me. This, John, the writer of that portion, of what Jesus said. He went on to say that this Jesus said signifying what death he would die. Jesus spoke about being lifted up. He spoke about being nailed to the cross and suffering for the sins of the world. The next point, number two, was that dealing with light, our spiritual enlightenment and uh, what we brought out with that uh, dealt with the centurion, the one who was over the soldiers who uh, uh, nailed Jesus to the cross. They were there to see that uh, the crucifixion was carried out. But as he observed the things that were happening on that day, the many words that Jesus said, he observed Jesus uh, not only his suffering, but his attitude, his mindset in the midst of his suffering. He observed also that there was darkness over the earth from the uh, noon hour to three that afternoon. He observed that when Jesus breathed his last, that there was a great earthquake. And somehow he got word that the veil on the temple had been torn from top to the bottom. And when he saw these things, the word says that he spoke up and said that surely or certainly this man was a righteous man. 
in the midst of the darkness, uh, he was enlightened in his mind and in his spirit. And so we get that. We learn from the crucifixion that we can be enlightened. We can be enlightened. The third point that we raised was that of love. When we think of Jesus going to the cross, dying for our sins, we think of love. Jesus spoke to his disciples again and said to them, Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. No greater love. He said, You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. The fourth point was that of obedience, obedience. Jesus uh, spoke further, speaking of his love that motivated him to go to the cross, his love of the Father, his love of mankind, his love of the world. Jesus said also that the world may know that I love the Father, he said, as he gave commandment, so I do. Obedience, obedience. Whatever the Father, he said, has commanded of me, that indeed is what I will do. And he went to the cross uh, knowing that it was the will of his Father. The fifth point dealt with cleansing. The word teaching us that without the shedding of blood, there can be no cleansing. There can be no remission of sins. Jesus said when he instituted the Lord's Supper, he said that this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sin, so that sins could be washed away. Jesus said, my blood being given will accomplish that feat. The sixth point, dealing with the cross on last Sunday, we looked at forgiveness. The Lord uh, dying on the cross in that incident as the two thieves, you recall, were nailed on each side of him on their crosses. And while one uh, reviled Jesus and criticized him, the other uh, was enlightened and uh, uh, said to the fellow thief, don't you fear God seeing that we too are dying and we just sleep for our sins, but this man has done nothing wrong and yet he's suffering, yet he's dying. And he looked at Jesus as uh, someone who was more than just a common man. And he said to him, Lord, when you come into your kingdom, you're going to a place that is better than what this earth can afford. You're going somewhere. That's where I want to go. That's where I want to be. Is where you're going. I want to be with you. So when you come into your kingdom... Remember me. Don't remember my sins, but remember me. And Jesus said to him, in forgiving him today, you'll be with me in paradise. Those thoughts we lifted, and there are many, many more, that as we search the scriptures and uh, the Lord reveals so much, uh, these are just a few thoughts that come to us from the crucifixion. But we must also consider when we think of the cross and the crucifixion, we have to think also of the cross and the resurrection, the resurrection. The act of the crucifixion and the thoughts of the crucifixion are really incomplete without the resurrection. Uh, the crucifixion of Jesus accomplished its purpose and, and uh, that's why Jesus said when he uh, died and when, when life 
uh, ebbed from his body, he said, it is finished. And he said to his father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Well, when he died, when he said, it is finished, he meant that what I have come to accomplish up to this point is finished. But yet there is something else uh, that lies beyond this point. There is more than the crucifixion. There is also, he is saying, what's to be considered, and that is the resurrection. You'll remember as Jesus was teaching, as he was talking with his disciples and with others uh, who would listen to him, Whenever Jesus talked about the cross, whenever he talked about his death, he included in his thoughts and in his points the resurrection also. He didn't end his teaching uh, of that, uh, dealing with the cross, and let that be it, and let that be all of it, but he talked also about the resurrection. Just uh, prior to his crucifixion, Jesus said, destroy this body, but in three days I'll raise it up. That point of the destruction of the body, that, that set uh, uh, in the minds of some of those who heard, but when he said in three days I'll raise it up, that just went over their heads. It was like it went in one ear and out the other. We find that he said to his disciples several times, as you look through uh, the gospel writings, not just once, but many times, he told them that he was going to be delivered into the hands of his enemies. He said, I will suffer. I will be rejected. I will be crucified. I will be killed. But on the third day, I'll rise again. He connected those thoughts. Jesus said on another occasion that as Jonah, uh, in the Old Testament, you remember Jonah and the whale, uh, the big fish, uh, the word says, Jesus said, that as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale or the big fish, so will the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. He wanted the people to think about Jonah being swallowed by the whale and being in what Jonah described as the depths of hell. Jesus said, I'll be in the belly or the heart of the earth. But that wasn't all of the story with Jonah. You remember that it was after those three days in the belly of the whale that the whale vomited Jonah up. Uh, Jesus was simply saying that I'll be in the heart of the earth, but I'm coming back again. I'm going to rise from the grave. And so we find Jesus bringing out just a few of these points of uh, uh, the crucifixion and also including in his thoughts about that, his teaching, including the resurrection. We find that now after his resurrection, this passage dealing with uh, 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 the day of the resurrection when, when uh, these two were leaving Jerusalem and traveling to their hometown in Emmaus, a few miles away, that Jesus encountered them. And uh, they did not know that it was Jesus because of their grief, because of their sorrow. They didn't recognize him as the Lord, and, and as they were walking, as they were talking, questioning these things, Jesus asked, what were you talking about uh, uh, on your way home? And they let it be known. We were talking about Jesus uh, who was crucified. And they asked him, where have you been, and who are you that you don't know what took place in Jerusalem of how this Jesus, our Savior, how he was crucified, how he died, and he was supposed to rise on the third day, but nobody has seen him as yet. And so Jesus went on 
with them. And the word says that he opened their eyes uh, 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 up to a point and let them know that it was him. But first, he had to reveal to them what the word had said, how the word had talked about crucifixion, but it also taught about his resurrection. Verse 30, uh, 25, rather again, he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Remember now, they didn't have the New Testament that talked about Jesus' resurrection, but they certainly had the whole Old Testament. And uh, they were learned in these passages of the Old Testament, but they had not connected it together. Jesus is saying to them, slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Don't you think, don't you remember what the word has said that this Jesus this Christ, this Savior, he would be put to death. He would suffer. But remember that the prophets also said he would rise again. He would enter into his glory. 27th verse says, beginning in Moses and all of the prophets. Now the first book of Moses in the Bible is Genesis. That's where it all starts. The first five books of the Bible are attributed to Moses' writing. And we have other of the writings of the prophets. Jesus opened their understanding to what the Word had to say throughout the Old Testament. Now you think Bishop preaches long sometimes. Think of what Jesus was doing with them. Opening unto them the whole of the Old Testament revealing unto them what the Word said about the suffering of the Savior, but that he indeed would rise again. We find, church, God's plan for the crucifixion always included the resurrection. It always included. They go together. God's plan included the crucifixion and the resurrection. The uh, disciples, they picked up on this point after Jesus had risen from the grave and as they were being used by the Lord and some of their writings were being put on paper uh, to come to us in the New Testament, uh, we find in the book of Acts in the second chapter, uh, we find Peter talking to those who had crucified Jesus, not only the rulers, but those who had praised Jesus on Palm Sunday and had uh, demanded that he be crucified on that Friday. Uh, these were the people who were there on this day, the day of Pentecost, uh, when Peter is talking to them at this time, but relating to them about the resurrection, the connection of the crucifixion with the resurrection. Peter says, Jesus who you crucified, you're the ones who crucified him, he's saying, and put to death. He was delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, a part of God's plan from the beginning. Not just that Jesus would come to die, but that he would rise again. It was the purpose and the foreknowledge of God, Peter said. God raised him up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that death should hold him. All right, all right. Peter went on to quote David in the Old Testament. In Psalm 16, Peter quoted him by saying, For David said, You will not leave my soul in hell, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. God's plan all along was the crucifixion and the resurrection. In the book of Hebrews, we find these words. 
when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The Hebrew writer was quoting from Psalm 110, Jesus opening some of these old passages that the disciples in the New Testament picked up on and were relating from the Old Testament. What was saying about though the Savior would die, but his body would not see corruption. It wouldn't be in the grave long enough to decay, nor to corrupt. Peter picked up on the thought. In his epistle, 1 Peter chapter 1, he said, we were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. He was foreordained, see God's plan, foreordained before the foundation of the world. But God raised him up, raised him from the dead, and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Oh, church, uh, uh, Peter was really quoting from uh, the book of Psalm in 46 Psalm and so many other passages that we have in the Old Testament. So what we're trying to get you to understand is that God's plan all along was to allow his son Jesus to send Jesus into the earth to die for our sins, but to raise him from the dead, raise him from the grave. And so those same thoughts that we associate with the crucifixion, they're also the same thoughts and the points that we have to associate with the resurrection. They're all tied together. Let us see those points again. We have some scriptures we'll just give to you quickly as we prepare to close. Uh, the point dealing with suffering. Let us see what uh, the word has to say uh, from 1 Peter and also from Philippians. In 1 Peter, suffering, Peter said, uh, for Christ also suffered, this is after Jesus' resurrection now, Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. He is the one, is what Peter is saying, who suffered. He went to the cross, but suffering on the cross wasn't the end. It was because of his suffering that when he died, being put to death in the flesh, he was made alive by the Spirit of God. Let us see what Paul says in this next passage from Philippians, the third chapter, in verses 8 through 11. Yet indeed, Paul is saying, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. Paul talking about his own suffering. And count them my suffering, he said, the loss of all things, but rubbish is just waste, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, he's saying, being conformed to his death if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. He's saying, I don't mind suffering for Christ because he suffered for me. I'm willing to suffer for the Lord because he suffered for me. I know that when I suffer for him because he suffered for me, that because he was raised from the dead, I want to experience that resurrection just as Jesus did. Let us look at the next thought. We find that being light. We talked about that dealing with the crucifixion in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. Paul says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Enlightenment, enlightenment. For with the heart, 
one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Oh, when we understand, when we believe that Jesus not only died, but that God raised him from the dead. When you believe that, oh, when you know it for yourself, we find that Paul said, that means you indeed are saved. The other point being that uh, after light is that of love. Paul says in Galatians 2 and 20, I have been crucified with Christ. Uh, what he's talking about here is that when Christ died, he died in our place. That means that we died too. We were nailed to the cross. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer, Paul says now, that I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Because Christ lives, he's saying, he loved me enough to die for me, or he loves me enough to live in me. The life that I now live is because of Christ, the risen Christ, who lives in me. The next point, as we move, it's that of obedience. We find that being connected to the cross and the resurrection Paul says, Philippians 2, verses 8 through 11, and being found in appearance as a man, talking about Jesus, Paul is, he's saying he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, because of his obedience, look what God did. God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. He raised him up. Not only did he raise him up, but he lifted his name up, giving him a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven, those on earth, those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The next point being that of cleansing. In Revelation chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, John the apostle being given direction by Jesus, John is writing, saying to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the firstborn, the first one to rise, never to die again. Firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth. To him who loved us and cleansed us, washed us from our sins in his own blood. The next slide there to complete the thought. Uh, there should have been another passage with that. Uh, from Revelation uh, 4, 5, and 6 didn't get up, should have been 4 through 6. But Paul, uh, uh, John, still speaking here, to him who loved us, washed us from our sins in his own blood, having cleansed us, but also having risen from the grave. We can go on to the last one then, and that is forgiveness. Acts 13, verses 36 through 38, for David after he had served his own generation by the will of God, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and saw corruption. David is still in the grave. Still in the grave today, saw corruption. But he who, uh, whom God raised up saw no corruption. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren, that through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. Not only that he died, oh, but also that he rose again. Church, this is what Jesus was wanting these to understand on the day of his resurrection and the day that we live in now that he rose from the grave and he's still alive today. The Lord is saying, to these on the Emmaus Road, 
as he still says to us, I am alive. I am alive. He is risen as he said. That's the message that the angels told the women who got to the tomb early that morning. He's not here. He's risen uh, as he said that he would do. He said he would arise. And so because the Lord lives, that's what the praise team was singing, because he lives, we live. And I'm not talking about just existing. Because he lives, that song is talking about I can face tomorrow. All fear is gone. I have hope. I have my position in Christ, my faith in Christ because he lives. Oh, church, because he lives. These men, when Jesus ultimately uh, 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 revealed himself while they were eating, he joined them in a meal. Then the word says he vanished from their eyes. And they realized they had been with Jesus. And they said to one another, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us by the way, while he opened unto us the scriptures? Church, when you believe on the risen Savior and when you trust in the risen Savior, when you walk with the risen Savior, your hearts will burn within you. You'll know for yourself that he is alive and that there's more to my life than just the breath that I breathe. The greater thing is the life of a risen Savior being within us, living, residing within us. The psalmist said in the 39th Psalm that as I muse, the fire burned. That word muse just means meditate. When I was in the Word, as I prayed, as I thought about the Lord, while I was meditating, thinking about it, thinking about what the Word said, appreciating what the Word says, appreciating the living Word, the fire began to burn the connection between the crucifixion and the resurrection. So let that risen Savior live in us. Let us keep trusting in him. Let us follow the footsteps of Jesus carrying our cross, knowing that when our time comes to die, and we all will, that we have the great assurance of life again because of Jesus Christ. Our praise team will come and lead us in another selection as the invitation is extended. And if there's anyone uh, desiring to come to the Lord to confess your sin, to let it be known that you're repenting and you're turning to Jesus, and you want that salvation that comes through believing in him from having your sins washed away, from having yourself cleansed in the blood of the Lamb, making a commitment to give your life to the Lord, to walk with him day by day, letting your steps be those of which you're carrying your cross because he did for us. We must carry the cross. But in going forward, we know that there is life everlasting for those who have believed on him. Let us stand. And if there are any to come to give your life to the Lord, any for prayer, whatever your needs might be, we extend the invitation.